And I invite you to join me this afternoon in John the 20th chapter. You may recognize this as being <clears throat> somewhat familiar. Well, it's because it is. Last Sunday I preached from John the 20th chapter. As a matter of fact, last Sunday, this portion that I'll be preaching from today was part of the text that we used as our primary text last Sunday. Not the whole thing, but part of it. John 20th, beginning at verse 14, and we'll read through verse number 17. I'm going to preach to us today on the topic, identity varies by location. I'm going to help people understand the apostolic doctrine of the oneness of God. Why we don't believe God is three people, but why God is one. How it is that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is in fact God Almighty, Jehovah, God our Father, revealed in human form to humanity. And you'll understand, I believe, by the end of this service better what we teach, what we believe in this subject. And I hope and I pray that I'm able to do this message justice. Identity varies by location. John chapter 20, verses 14 through 17. The King James text today reads, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Identity varies by location. Would you bow your heads with me another moment? Father, we love you. Master, we are so grateful for the word of God. This is in fact today a divine document. This is today, O oh God, a word from our Heavenly Father that allows us to understand you. Allows us, Lord, to uh, understand the deep things of God. Master, you've laid on my heart a message for this hour that is very important. People of God need to understand what I'm about to share. And I will not be able to effectively communicate to the people of God that which you would have me to communicate except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch the preacher of the gospel today. Lord, anoint as well the ear of every hearer, but not just the ear, anoint as well the mind, the heart. Give us a mind to receive, give us a heart, God, today that is cultivated as good ground, ready and prepared to receive the word of God with gladness, that it might take root and it might spring forth, and bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all today, O oh God, and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. This is going to be a heavy-duty message today. 
and I will be sharing a lot of scripture with you. I was talking to somebody this week on the phone who has been a friend of mine and a uh, extended member of our church for many, many years and a supporter of this ministry for many years. And I told him, I said, when I preach, uh, oftentimes I probably offer a whole lot more information than I should. I probably repeat myself more often than I should. I probably offer far more scripture references than I should. But I do so because I want the hearer to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the message they are hearing is not opinion, it is the Word of God. And the Word of God today teaches us that Scripture answers Scripture. You do not look for answers to theological questions. You do not look for answers related to passages in the Word of God which would appear to conflict with or contradict other passages. You do not look for explanations and reasons for this in the realms of reason. No. Scripture answers Scripture. If you look in the Word of God, you will find the answer and it will be understood. But let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, let's get into the message. I'm going to have to stay close to the pulpit today because if I don't, I'll never get through this in the time that I have. Many people today cannot understand the concept of the oneness of God and the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although the Word of God over and over again makes clear that God's Messiah, His promised one, His anointed one, was to be none other than Jehovah God Himself. And although the testimony of the New Testament writers makes clear that Jesus Christ the man was in fact God robed in sinful flesh, they become stopped every time they fall upon a passage in the Bible that would seem to suggest otherwise. Rather than being a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, they attempt to dismantle the clearly articulated truth of God's Word to make it comply, listen carefully to what I'm saying, to make it comply with the less supported exception passages. Now there are certain truths that the Word of God makes abundantly clear. For instance, that Jesus Christ is God, that He is God manifest in flesh. But then we bump into a verse over here, like in our primary text today. Jesus said to Mary, after His resurrection, He said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses be the first to run in and say, See, here's proof that he is not God. Because he says right here, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. Therefore, this is for... Oh, really? Honey, I got news for you. There ain't a doctrine in the Jehovah's Witness uh, lineup that I can't find a, a passage of Scripture that will totally contradict it. That they don't have to find a way to explain around it in order to support their claim as to what the, the truth is. There's always going to be. We're talking about a book that was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Chaldee, not a book that was written in the King's English, a book that has been translated by men 
into languages that are structured very differently. Uh, at times in human history when things were said very differently. And yet we have people, boy, I mean to tell you, they'll read one passage here, one passage here, that seems to contradict this other. And immediately now they go with the contradiction rather than the established truth. Now why would they do this? Well, it's simple. Because they are predisposed to reject the greater truth in favor of something which God's Word does not clearly teach and support. In other words, if you're predisposed to believe that uh, God is, for instance, a trinity, then you read a passage which indicates that God in fact is one and that he is not three persons and boy you'll find every way under the sun to explain your way out of that one. Why? Because you're busy explaining what you want to believe mm -hmm. and unexplaining what you do not want to believe. The Jehovah's Witnesses amongst other cults refuse to accept and acknowledge the truth of the divinity of Jesus Christ. And therefore, any passage that would suggest this, they're going to find a way to explain it away. Any passage that at face value appears to contradict the divinity of Christ, and they're going to jump on it and say, see, here's the proof. This proves what I'm saying. But which ought we to be accepting and which ought we be to uh, working toward better understanding? The established greater truth or the exception passages? Do you follow what I'm saying? Obviously, we ought to be trying to understand the exception passages in light of the greater truth, not accepting the exception passages, and all of a sudden throwing out all of the greater truth. Now they know this because this is how they operate in every doctrine they want to accept and they want to teach. That is how they approach scripture when it comes to a doctrine they want to teach. If there's a passage that contradicts it, well then obviously they try to reconcile the contradictory passage with what they're wanting to teach. Am I telling the truth? Everybody does this. I didn't grow up in the apostolic movement. I didn't grow up in a one God Jesus name church. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. But it was not apostolic. And it probably is for this reason that I am predisposed to uh, take on the very complex matters of God's word. I don't shy away from passages that are contradictory. I don't shy away from passages that would call into question the, funda the fundamental truths of our faith. I've belonged to apostolic churches in my lifetime, Tommy, and had pastors who I can honestly say I never one time heard that pastor preach a message on the oneness of God. Did I hear him say God is one? You know, did I hear him use the catchphrases and the popular phrases, you know, regarding the oneness? Oh, yeah. But did he ever go into any detail whatsoever in teaching on this doctrine of the oneness of God, the divinity of God? No, he did not. I've had pastors in the apostolic movement, I'll be frank and honest with you, to this day, some of them are dead and buried, and to this day, I honestly doubt highly in my spirit that they really believed this message, or at least this portion of the message. But the Word of God has admonishes us in 2 Timothy 2.15, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth. Well, what does that tell you when Paul tells Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth? I'll tell you what it tells me. It tells me that you can either cut this cake right or you can cut this cake wrong. Hello now. Mm -hmm. If he's admonishing Timothy to rightly divide the word of God, well then that tells me that it is possible to divide the word of God incorrectly. Is right. that, am, I, am I not telling the truth? Yep. In Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, we talk about this in our church all the time. I'm constantly pounding this into the hearing of our church members. Whom shall he, meaning God, teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. In other words, you've got to be a little more on the mature side. You've got to be a little more grown up. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The truth of God, the meaty substance of the Word of God, the meat of Scripture, is understood and it is taught to us by God in a fashion that requires we rightly divide the Word of God. Because the Lord says in the uh, Old Testament prophet, He says, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's kind of like pulling together a jigsaw puzzle and putting all the pieces together. There are times you're putting a puzzle together and you pick up a piece and at first glance it looks like this piece will fit over here. But when you try to smash it in there, it doesn't quite fit. It. it doesn't quite work. Well, if it doesn't quite work, then honey, you'd be a fool to grab a hammer and try to make it work. Hello now. Because ultimately, when the picture is done, it is not going to look right. It is not going to be right. There are many churches, there are many denominations, there are many cults in our world today. They have taken the Word of God and they have tried to make pieces fit where they don't fit. They have tried to make things go where they don't go. And in so doing, they create a picture that is inaccurate, that is false, that is wrong. If you're going to understand the Word of God correctly, if God is going to be able to teach you, if He is going to be able to make you understand doctrine, sound doctrine, doctrine then you must grow up you got to get off the milk you got to be weaned you've got to mature and get to the place where you understand it takes work it takes effort you must study to show yourself approved unto God reading the Bible and studying the Bible are not the same thing A sincere student of God's Word understands that serious, sincere study requires that we reconcile exception passages with the greater established truth, not the other way around. We're not trying to explain away the established doctrine, the established truth, because of or in light of the exception passages. You follow what I'm saying? That's not how it works. Christ and God, my friend today, are one. There is a clear way that I can illustrate this to you. There is a clear way I can help you understand this. Matthew 16, verse 27. The Word of God declares, For the Son of Man shall come... In the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then shall he, excuse me, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. The Son of Man shall come how? In the glory of his Father. Matthew 25, 31 through 33. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. 
Now, wait a minute. Matthew 16, Jesus said he'd return in the glory of his Father. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, this is Jesus talking, mind you. This isn't somebody writing, you know, about him. This is him speaking. In this passage, he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Oh, so you mean Jesus is not sitting in a throne in heaven right now? No, he is not. Because the work of redemption is not yet complete. What? Are you saying that Jesus hasn't done everything necessary to save lost man? No, that isn't at all what I said. The work of salvation is complete. The work of redemption is not yet complete. Well, what's the difference, Pastor? We sing, I'm saved, saved, saved by the blood of the crucified one. We sing the song, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't salvation and redemption, aren't they one and the same? No, they are not. No, they are not. Salvation has been provided for. Redemption is when God makes good on his promise to receive those who have believed and obeyed the gospel and been saved by faith when he receives them unto himself, when he takes them out of the earth and draws them up heavenward and brings them into his presence, he is at that time redeeming them. I can give you a coupon. If you go to this store and present this coupon, they will allow you to take a brand new gas cooker for free. Here, you want a free cooker? Boy, Tommy is getting his jacket on already because he'd love to have a free cooker. You want a free cooker? I've got a coupon for a free cooker. All you've got to do is take this coupon down there to Lowe's and give it to the guy behind the register and you'll get a free cooker. Got news for you. You're holding that ticket. You're holding that coupon. It's as good as holding that cooker. The only difference is that coupon does you no good until you've done what? Until you've redeemed it. Until you've actually done what is necessary to comply with the conditions so that the cooker comes into your possession. Do you follow what I'm saying? We are God's, according to the word of God, we are God's purchased possession. He has purchased us, but he has not yet redeemed us. When you go to a car dealer, <clears throat> at least it used to be back in the day when I sold cars. Nowadays, you're able to drive the car home from the dealer the same day. But back in the day, we'd go to a car dealer and you would talk to them and negotiate and come up with a price and come to terms and then you would give them a down payment. And you would then sign some paperwork saying that I am going to buy this car and if I should for any reason back out of uh, the purchase of this car, I lose my down payment. Am I telling the truth? But then you'd have to come a day or two later, because they had to make the car ready, they had to get it all inspected, they had to get it all uh, uh, registered and all that uh, before that you could take it. Am I telling the truth? Then you would go later and you would redeem your purchased possession. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You'd go ahead and get it. Now, is it yours? Yeah, you've already signed all the paperwork. As far as the car dealer is concerned, it's yours. As far as you're concerned, it's yours. But there are some things that have to be done so that you then can redeem it. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Well, that is the case with the rapture. That is the case with the resurrection of uh, the people of God. God is going to one day redeem us. The Bible said that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is God's earnest payment. On the church, when God fills us with the Holy Ghost, that's Him making a deposit on us. And then, 
The redemption will come at the time of the rapture, at the time of the resurrection of the church. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, he's going to come in the glory of his Father, in his Father's glory. Then, just nine chapters later in the book of Matthew, he said he'll return in his glory. But listen to what Jehovah God has said in Isaiah 42 and 8. Remember, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. In Isaiah 42 and 8, the Lord God Jehovah declares, I am the Lord. The term translated Lord in the Old Testament Hebrew is the word that we commonly understand as Jehovah. So he said, I am Jehovah, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. In Isaiah 48, verses 11 and 12, For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. And I am also the last. So God declares, I don't give my glory away. If I'm going to get credit for something, I get the credit for it. I do not let somebody else take credit for what I have done. Yet Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, he'll return in the glory of his Father. But then he later says, when he returns, he'll return how? In his glory. Well, this isn't too hard to get, folks. The glory of the Father is the Lord's glory because he is the Father. Hallelujah. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Now, I, I'm going to get this message going to get a lot deeper, so you've got to stay with me. John 17, 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, meaning I have brought your glory to the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O oh Father, listen... Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So now Jesus is saying, before the world even existed, I shared the Father's glory. Well, how is that possible? How is that possible? God doesn't, he doesn't share his glory. He doesn't give his glory to anybody. He said, I won't give my glory to anybody else. If they're separate people, then there's a major theological problem here. Can't be Michael the archangel. Can't possibly be because God don't share his glory with anybody. He is not going to do something and call himself Savior when in fact the true Savior was Michael the Archangel. When the true Savior was a separate person of the Godhead. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? No, God doesn't do that. God's glory is his own. He only takes credit for that which he has done and he refuses to share credit for that which he alone has done. 
In Colossians 1, 19 and 20, the word of God said, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, meaning by Christ, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in heaven, or thing, or excuse me, things in earth, or things in heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul writes, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. What? Jesus Christ did not reconcile us to God? No. God reconciled us unto himself. Who did the reconciling? God did. Somebody else didn't reconcile on his behalf. Are you following what I'm saying? Nobody else reconciled us to God on God's behalf. No, no, no. God reconciled us unto himself by Christ Jesus, by Jesus Christ. But listen. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, meaning in other words... That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. As a man, Jesus is referred to in the word of God as the second Adam. As the man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, through obedience, took back that which Adam had forfeited in the Garden of Eden. How? Through disobedience. So God manifested himself as the man, Jesus Christ, so that through obedience, he could take back what Adam had forfeited through what? Disobedience. Was there a man uh, in heaven or in earth that would be capable of being so devoted to the plan of God that he would be entirely, completely, 100% obedient to the will and purpose and plan of God? No. God had to do this. The only one who can be absolutely obedient to what I have set forth is me. The only one whom the law can literally uh, label as being perfect and sinless and holy according to the conditions of the Old Testament law. The only person who can meet all those conditions is me. There's none that is righteous. No, not one. God said, am I telling the truth? And now the word of God said, there is none that is righteous. No, not one. Let's continue. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47, and, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. <laughs> Deuteronomy tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You ask any Jew on this planet, you do not identify anyone at any time as Lord except you be speaking of God. Honey, if there was anybody on this planet who understood this, it was the Apostle Paul, who himself was a Pharisee. You've got to remember that the writers of the New Testament, the majority of them, were devout religious Jewish men who 
obeyed and lived according to until Jesus, the law of Moses. They had codes they followed. They had rules they followed. Paul would never say the second man is the Lord from heaven, except he be referring to God himself. Otherwise, he would have said, was the Son of God, or was the second person of the Holy Trinity, or was the one whom God provided to you. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, he would have specifically said, he would not simply have said, the Lord from heaven. There are occasional passages in the Word of God which would appear to suggest that the deity of Christ is not an established truth. But when you allow the Holy Ghost to lead you and teach you, as the Word of God promises He will, you find that the Lord's human identity and His divine identity varies according to his location. While on earth he is the Son of God, meaning God manifest in the flesh. But when the man Jesus Christ, when that physical man Jesus Christ is seen in heaven, he is repeatedly and consistently referred to as the Son of Man. You do not see Jesus in heaven being referred to as the Son of God. You see him being referred to in heaven as the Son of Man. His human appearance and nature then being emphasized. That's what, when you use the term Son of Man, all you're doing is emphasizing that this is something, someone that has a human appearance, okay? I am the pastor of a church, and many see me as a pastor and a man of God. But when I'm in the presence of my Father, I suddenly am no longer a pastor and a man of God, but rather I am His Son. Have I changed? Am I a different person? Am I no longer a pastor? No. No has nothing to do with me no longer being a pastor. has to do with the relationship I have with the individual that I'm with. has to do with my location, has changed my identity. My identity is the same still. But because I'm in a different place with different people, suddenly my identity changes. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? So therefore, listen to me now. My identity varies by location, where I am and who I am with. When the Lord returned to heaven after he ascended, the separation he experienced in spirit from the greater mass of the Spirit of God the Father. You've got to remember, the Bible said God is a Spirit. God is a Spirit. God is a Spirit. God is a Spirit. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not confined by time or space. God has declared, the earth is my throne, the heaven is my footstool. The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Lord, my mind is tired today. Uh, <laughs> if the earth... If the heavens are his throne and the heavens are spanceless, that they go on and on and on and on and on, and the earth is figuratively his footstool, then you tell me how you can sit on the right hand of God. Where are you going to sit? God is a spirit. He is not a being. He is not a person. Therefore, where are you going to sit? When Jesus said, I'm going to be with the Father, was he talking about a person or was he talking more about a place? Why do you think he constantly used the phrase, my Father which is in heaven? Meaning he's trying to differentiate between the abode of the Spirit. Do you follow what I'm telling you? On the earth he is called the Son of God. Because now we have a, a God's Spirit revealed to us in the person of a man. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. But when that man ascends back to heaven, 
Now that portion of the Spirit of God that is within him is rejoined with the greater portion. Do you follow? It's like taking a spoonful of water out of the ocean. You can take that spoonful of water to a lab and they can test it and they can tell you chemically exactly what the entire ocean is comprised of. Chemically. They don't need the whole ocean. They don't have to test the entire ocean. They don't have to test an entire lake. They don't have to pump, Tommy, every drip of water out of a lake in order to test it to tell you what is in that water. Am I telling the truth? No. All you need is a little tiny sampling. God was in Christ. He was a spoonful of the Spirit of God. Do you follow? But everything God is was in Christ. Everything God is. Everything. It pleased God that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Him bodily. Hallelujah. Are you getting this? You following me so far? I haven't even gotten to the exciting part yet, but I'm getting there. So when the Lord returned to heaven... The separation, in effect, that he experienced in, in the, the spirit aspect from the greater mass of the Spirit of God was blurred. It was erased. His human form and appearance, therefore, in heaven is not that of the Son of God. It's no longer God manifest in the flesh because now the flesh is in the presence of the Spirit of God. It's in the place where the Spirit of God is everywhere and all over the place. So he's no longer the Spirit of God. He's no longer God manifest in the flesh. Now he is a man manifested in the presence of God. Now listen. you got to listen carefully. Jesus Christ consistently referred to himself while on the earth as the Son of Man. Isn't it funny he didn't run around constantly saying, I'm the Son of God. Why, the Son of God came to do this. The Son of God came to do that. Why did he not say that? Why did he not use that language? Now, there were times when he, you know, someone said, are you the Son of God? And he said, well, what do you say? Do you follow? But he did not constantly use the title Son of God, but he constantly used the title Son of Man. He did so as it was imperative to his, for the benefit of his followers that they understand his divine identity, but that they also not reduce God in their thinking to being nothing more than a man. Why did God constantly talk about my Father which is in heaven? Well, because if I run around saying I'm the Son of God, I'm God in human form, and I emphasize that all the time, then what's going to happen is you're going to begin to equate God with this man, and you're going to see God as a man, and you're going to lose sight of the fact that God is more than a man. He is manifesting himself as a man, but God is not a man. Do you follow what I'm trying to to say. So it was imperative that he constantly used the phrase son of man, son of man. He wanted to emphasize I'm human just like you are. I'm a person just like you are. I'm flesh and blood just like you are. And it would seem like Lord why in the world do you constantly refer to yourself throughout the, the uh, gospel accounts as the son of man, not the son of God. He came to do a work as a man. Had his humanity been blurred by his divinity, he might never have been able to do what he had come to do. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul writes, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Listen, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified 
the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Why did Jesus say over and over again, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Why did he use Son of Man? Why did he emphasize humanity? Because he had come to do a work as a man. Mm -hmm. If you get it in your head, I'm the Son of God. If you get it in your head that I'm divine. You get it in your brain that I'm the physical manifestation of God Almighty. And guess what? They may never crucify me. They may never allow me to go to the cross. They may cast me up on their shoulders and carry me through the city and worship me. Which, would there be anything wrong with that in effect? No. People came and worshipped at the Lord's feet all the time. And not one time, not one time, not one time, not one time, not one time did he ever say, Oh, don't do that. I'm just a man like you are. But every single time an angel was worshipped by men, did they not refuse worship? Guess what, Jehovah's Witnesses? Jesus is not Michael the Archangel. Because had he been, he would have been obligated to refuse worship. Otherwise, he would have been committing and allowing people to commit the greatest offense toward God that can ever be committed. They'd have been worshiping him as God when he was not God. Nobody, the Bible said people came and worshiped the Lord, and not one single time did he ever say, Don't worship me, I'm just a man. Oh, hallelujah. When, whoo, glory, when Peter and John came to the temple, to the gate that is called Beautiful, and the lame man was healed, and people ran to them and began to fall at their feet and worship them, what did Peter and John say? Get up! Get up! Stop doing that! We're just men like you! There was a reason Jesus had to emphasize in the earth his humanity. There was a reason he used the language that he used. Because identity varies by location. Mm -hmm. In James chapter 2 and verse 1, James, the, uh, the uh, uh, Lord's brother, writes, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. <laughs> James knew who his brother was. He knew who Jesus was. He said, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Paul said, If they'd have known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified who? The Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm here to tell you, folks, line upon line, precept upon precept, mm -hmm. here a little, there a little. In John chapter 1, verse 18, John the apostle whom Jesus loved. He makes this statement. No man, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Notice he said, no man hath seen God at any time. He doesn't say, but the Son of God saw him. The Son of God has seen him. He said, no man hath seen God at any time. But the Son of God, listen, he then uses present tense language, which is in the bosom of the Father. You remember what we talked about when it came to the term Abraham's bosom last week? Did that mean that he was literally in Abraham's chest? No. But it meant he was in the embrace of Abraham. He was in the place where Abraham was when Jesus would say, I go unto my father. He is not talking about, I'm going to go bury myself in his bosom. He was saying, I'm going to that place where my father's spirit is all encompassing. It is all embracing. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So John said, the only begotten son, the only man ever physically born of God, which is in, not which was in, 
which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. The term bosom in the Greek is kolpos, K-O-L-P-O-S. It can mean the front of the body between the arms. It can mean the bosom of a garment, the hollow formed by the upper forepart of a loose garment bound by a girdle or sash used for keeping and carrying things. Basically, it's a fold or a pocket in your garment that they would refer to as uh, the bosom. But it also can mean a bay of the sea. You remember what I said to you a few minutes ago about taking a spoonful of water out of the ocean? And everything that's in that ocean, you're going to have in that spoon. A bay of the sea. In other words, Jesus Christ is that little offshoot from the ocean that is ocean. Mm -hmm. But it's not called the ocean. Why? Because it's different. It's somehow set up differently. It's cut out from an area in the earth, yet it feeds into the ocean, and it is fed by the ocean. If you take water out of the bay, you're going to find everything in that water that is in the ocean, because it is not separate from the ocean. It is not different from the ocean. It is merely a different aspect of the ocean. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So he says... But the Son of, uh, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, or in effect, who is a bay as compared to the entirety of the ocean, he hath declared him. In the Greek, the term that is used, uh, that is translated in the King James as declared, literally means to lead out. To be a leader, to go before, metaphorically to draw out in narrative, to unfold the teaching, to recount, to rehearse, to unfold or to declare. In uh, things relating to God, it is used in Greek writing to the interpretation of things sacred and divine, oracles and dreams. Now listen, I'm trying to hurry because I'm running out of time. In the book of Revelation, John describes Jesus as having the appearance of a son of man. In Revelation 1.13, And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Revelation 14, 4. And I looked, and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Why did the Lord habitually refer to himself as the Son of Man? Identity varies by location. Why did he do this throughout his earthly ministry? Here, here's going to come something that will blow your mind. Because the title Son of Man identified him, listen to me children, as the one who was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. See, we Christians, we Westerners, those of us from the Western part of the world, those of us who didn't grow up Jewish, those of us who don't understand the Old Testament law and the prophets, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. He says throughout the entire Old Testament, you're going to read about me. Really, Jesus? That's funny because... According to this group and that group and this doctrine and that doctrine, you're not even mentioned until the New Testament. So how are you telling us if we search the Old Testament, they testify of you. You remember, before the Lord ascended, the Word of God said, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand what? The Scriptures. You remember last week we read after the resurrection, that as of yet they did not understand the Scriptures. 
that he must die and rise again. Do you follow? So there was a lot of things related to the Old Testament scriptures, the law, and the prophets that his own followers didn't get until after he was about to ascend and he opened their understanding. So they'd understand the scriptures. Well, here's a little tidbit. Here's a little revelation for you. There's the, oh, hallelujah. There's a reason Jesus ran around constantly referring to himself as the Son of Man. Because in so doing, anyone who knew the scriptures understood what he was saying. Daniel 3.25. He answered and said, Oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, 11, excuse me, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, now, what did we just read in Revelation 14, 14? And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. But listen, I saw in the night vision, Daniel said, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting, is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." Every single time Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, he is referring to himself as the figure who is described in the book of Daniel, who one day is going to be worshipped and served by every kingdom, by every kindred, by every tribe, by every nation, by every language. Hallelujah to God. You see, but if you didn't know the scriptures, then you wouldn't understand this. God don't do nothing by accident, I know. God didn't do nothing by accident. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33, you question whether what I've just said is accurate. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus, when the angel's talking to her about her uh, being chosen by God to bear the Son of God. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Now listen. He shall be great and he and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father Jake David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Is that not the exact language from Daniel chapter 7? Mm -hmm. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 30, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. There's a reason Jesus used the term Son of Man. There's a reason Jesus constantly used the title Son of Man. Yet, interestingly enough, when King Nebuchadnezzar 
saw four men walking about in the burning fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and a fourth man. He referred to the fourth man as what? The Son of God. Why? Because identity varies by location. Mm -hmm. The king answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Had nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar having any understanding of a Trinity doctrine. Nothing right. in the world. It had to do with the fact that the fourth man appeared to Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. to be God in human form. That simple. Mm -hmm. Identity varies by location. In heaven, the humanity of Christ the Messiah does the work of a victorious man in the presence of the Spirit of God. But on earth, the divinity of Christ does for humanity what only the divine can do. Identity varies by location. But because one aspect of who we are is brought out by our location, this does not mean that we still do not possess the other identity by which we are known. Right. I can be both a pastor and a son. When my mother is in church with us, I am both of these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. She's watching her pastor. She's also hearing her son. Do you follow what I'm telling you? She's, she's not listening to her pastor and her son is nowhere. No, I am both to her. Do you follow what I'm saying? Identity varies by location, by proximity. When she is not physically in our presence, I am still... A son. And I am still a pastor. But no one in the room views me as a son because to them I am not a son. I am a pastor. Jesus Christ, God in human form, accomplished as a man what no man devoid of divinity within could possibly do. This is why as a man he is described as conquering all things uh, and having made all things subject unto himself, he did this as a man. He did it as a man so that believing humanity might partake in and share his victory and authority. In 1 Peter 3.22, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God? Again, if the heavens are my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the right hand of God? The term right hand of God refers to a position of power and authority. When you say someone is your right hand man, that doesn't mean that every single time they look at you, that person is on your right hand. You know, No, it means that they in effect have all the power and all the authority you've got because you utilize them. They are there to do Anything and everything that you need done. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. Oh, I'm sorry. 1 Peter 3, 22. I've got to finish. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So the physical manifestation of God, Jesus Christ, in heaven is a man to whom all of these things have become subject. He is a man who has become victorious and conquered. He is a man who has done all these things. Does that change the fact he's God? Not in the least. He's still God. You wonder why I use this illustration today. When George W. and George H. W. Bush are sitting side by side, and George W. is occupying the White House as President of the United States, that means that George H.W., the elder, is sitting beside his son, but he's also sitting beside the President of the United States. Does he have to be one or the other, or can he be both? He can be both. People say, yeah, but God, the Bible said that the Son of Man in Daniel, that there was one with the appearance of a Son of Man, he's called the Son of Man, and he appeared before the Ancient of Days. Yes, because we all know that God cannot possibly be in more than one place at one time. 
Because we know the Bible tells us clearly that God is incapable. It is impossible for God to be more than one. As a matter of fact, God is not three people. God is billions of people. Because every person in the world who prays, every person in the world who needs God and talks to God, he has to send a separate person to them. No, people don't understand. Many instances in Scripture, we see a divine drama. We see a play being acted out. In the book of Revelation, it talks about God being in his throne and there being um, a character that appears that says, as a lamb that has been slain with seven eyes and seven horns. Now, do you think literal? That's referring to a literal lamb that has seven eyes and seven horns? Of course not. But what we're doing is we're seeing a divine drama played out in order to illustrate what God has done. When God showed Daniel, the Son of Man, appearing before the Ancient of Days, God is playing out a divine drama in front of Daniel. Who plays both characters? God does. Who's the only qualified character, only qualified person to play either character? God is. Almost done. I'm taking extra time because I'm running late. First Timothy 2, 5, and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Listen. The man, Christ Jesus. Notice Paul does not write to Timothy, Christ Jesus. As though it were a separate person. No, he specifically refers to what? The humanity of Christ Jesus. What is the mediator between God and man? The humanity of Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. John 14, 6 through 11, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye would, should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Jesus literally is chiding him as though this is a ridiculous request. What you're asking is ridiculous, Philip. Obviously, you don't get this. Obviously, Philip, you, you have no clue what you're talking about. Believest thou not that, listen to the wording here, because this is wording that many people have often not at all understood. We, we look at this and say, why in the world did the Lord say this this way? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. You had the humanity and you had the divinity. You had the divinity clothed in a human form. He said, there ain't a word come out of my mouth that's coming out of my, it's, that's sourced in me. No, every word that comes out of me is sourced by the Spirit within me, which is God, the Father. Verse 11, John 14. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Oh, children, in closing today, the day is coming when the divine work of God will be fully accomplished. And Jesus Christ will no longer need to be seen or identified in human terms. And his, his identity will be 
divine and divine only. Hallelujah. In Revelation 21, 2 through 7, John the Apostle writes, And I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What is tabernacle? Tabernacle literally means a mobile dwelling, tent. The tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. He will dwell with them. Now, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. I could go through it, but I don't have time today. Over and over and over and over again, we see Jesus in the word of God say, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Am I telling the truth? We see Jehovah God in the Old Testament saying, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Is there a contradiction here? No, that's the point. Line upon line, precept upon precept. When you put these pieces to the puzzle together, you understand that this one over here in the Old Testament is the same one as this one over here mm -hmm. in the New Testament. 1 John 3, 1 and 2, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Who did it not know? Who is the subject of this sentence? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Who is the pronoun him referring to? The pronoun him is referring to the noun father. The subject is father. It knew not the father. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. One day we'll no longer see him as the son of God. God manifest in human form. We will see him as God. In Revelation, he said, the day's coming, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my sons. Hallelujah. It'll no longer be necessary. This whole physical manifestation is done for the purpose of salvation and redemption. Revelation 4 and 2. Got two more scriptures, and I'm done. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one, one, sat on the throne. Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. And there shall be no more curse, referring to sin, but the throne of God and of the Lamb. How many sit in the throne? One does. But what is the throne called? It's called the throne of God and of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Why? It's very easy. 
because God is the Lamb. Hallelujah. They are the same. Glory to God, they're one and the same. We are going to, throughout eternity, look at the throne of God and know that God gave himself so that we could be there. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. He became the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world so that we could be there. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Identity has a lot to do with where we're at and who we're with. Our identity varies by location. When God is manifested in human form, on earth we call him the Son of God. When God is manifested in human form in heaven, we call him the Son of Man. But the Son of Man is not one thing and the Son of God another. No, they're one and the same. They're simply different titles that refer to God in different locations, refer to God in different circumstances, refer to God in terms of his relationship with the individuals mm -hmm. that he is in the presence of. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ did. God did not come to earth simply to do something on earth. No, there are things that he is still doing as a human form, God in human form in heaven. He's sitting at the right hand, meaning he is on hold. He, he's in a place of waiting at the moment, a place of waiting and authority. He's not sitting in the throne of God yet. Why? Because he hadn't finished his job as Redeemer. See, the Bible said that the day is coming when he's going to fight the battle of Armageddon. Well, when he fights the battle of Armageddon, he's going to appear as what? The Son of Man. He's going to appear as a man. Am I telling the truth? Therefore, that human form has not yet been discarded. That human form is still necessary. The Bible said that the day is coming when the Lord returns, when Israel will look upon him whom they pierce. They're going to be able to look at Jesus and know it's Jesus. They're going to recognize him as the one they crucified. That's what the word of God says. Got news for you, Jehovah's Witnesses. We ain't talking about Michael the Archangel. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. Not as soon as he got back to heaven, he was no longer Jesus. Now he's Michael the Archangel and baloney. Garbage. Because when he returns, Israel will be able to look upon him whom they pierced, and they're going to know, uh-oh, we're in trouble. This is the guy we crucified. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you, children, understanding the oneness of God, understanding the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that God is one, it is not necessary that God be multiple persons in order to perform multiple tasks, in order to manifest himself in a, mul in a, in a variety of ways simultaneously. Yes, he can be the man being baptized by John in the River Jordan. He can be the dove that is coming down out of heaven. He can be the voice that comes from heaven all at the same time and still be one singular God, not three people. It is not necessary that God be three people to be fulfilling three separate duties and three separate functions and performing as three different characters all simultaneously. He can do it as three. He can do it as 3,000. But he is one God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Would you stand with me this afternoon?